Okay. All right. So, where are we? So, um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Um, I see we have about 12 people who have dialed in. Um, one thing that I will say is that I don't have anybody physically here to be interacting with. So, um, one of the always one of the problems with this is that it's harder to just interact. I'm looking at a computer screen and a camera, and I know there's humans there, but I don't have any cues about um, what you're getting, what you're understanding, whether this is too simple, too complex. So, um, if you, as you're listening, if there's things that um, you want to say or whatnot, or just things you want to clarify, feel absolutely free to um, pop in at any time. So um, this is a more of a kind of an informational lecture. One of the things that I found over the years is that people think of NIH as this um, monolith and they don't have a really comprehensive understanding of how the NIH is organized. Um, they don't have a really good understanding of how you as a extramural investigator really interact with the um, folks at NIH. So what I, um, well, the reason that this um, module is in the course is to just give you an idea of who do you interact with, who do you talk to, and what all of the various um, acronyms mean. So um, just the, the biggest thing to keep in mind is that the NIH is a very large agency within the US Department of Public Health and Human Services. NIH itself is, um, has a number of moving parts and a number of components. And so, you need to understand really how it's structured so that you can communicate with it as effectively as possible. Now, the first thing to keep in mind is, is that while there is an NIH central administration, you probably will have very little interaction with it. Um, NIH itself is composed, comprised of 27 institutes and centers, as well as the office of the director, which is the central administrative unit. The thing to understand is that while the director of NIH is a very important role, the role is largely external communication with the world and to make sure that there are direct supervisors. So if you think about this, the director might be the equivalent of the university president. A large portion of the director's job is communicating with the US Congress. Um, while their job is to make sure that there aren't any big problems at the way the institution is being run. They don't really have a lot of influence on what is being directly done at the NIH. The and pretty much all of the work of NIH is centered on the institutes and centers. A, there is a small proportion of the NIH budget that is held by the office of the director, but it's really a very trivial component of the complete NIH grants making. Um, on. Now, the, um, what this means is that direct grant making is performed by institutes. And each institute and the funding of the institutes is only very indirectly determined by the office of the director. The office of director puts together a draft budget, which then goes to Congress. But fundamentally, the funding levels of individual NIH institutes, it's set by congressional um, oversight. It is not officially, it is proposed by the Office of the Director, but it is not sent by the Office of the Director. This is why a lot of institutes also have more direct lobbying arms. Um, now, the, um, there are also a whole host of centers and offices which are different than institutes. They have can have very, very diverse missions. Um, However, it's always good to look and be aware of what the missions of centers and offices are, particularly those of you who do not work on traditional wet science type of biomedical research. A lot of the um, centers and offices, there are a lot of roles in relationship to community-based medicine. And I know there's a lot of um, scientists in the CTR that centers and offices may have a lot of benefit or a lot of um, focus on. 
Um, the Office of Director, that the small amount of grant making they do is often on sort of interdisciplinary research that doesn't fit into a um, actual institute. It is a very, very small percentage of the NIH budget though. Um, the Fogarty Center focuses um, largely on um, international collaborations with the US biomedical community. Um, NCATS is a new institute that is centered on, um, it is basically capture a lot of the translational medicine um, sort of money. Um, then there's the National Center for Complementary and Integrated Health. This was a center that was put together by an act of Congress who really wanted to have some scientific investigations of non-traditional um, medical therapies. Um, but again, all of these have a, are just a very small proportion of the entire NIH budget. So you might be able to fit into the niche, but it's um, that the funding for these centers can be very, very um, competitive. For instance, the National Center for Complementary and Integrated Health has probably one of the lowest um, success rates for grants, that they get way more grants than they ever fund. And at least at one point, their success rates were in the two to 3% range. I did not look to see what the most recent numbers are. And that's because that it does exist, there is money associated with it, but it's not huge amounts of money compared to something like the National Cancer Institute. Now, another thing you have to understand about institutes is, is that they have two arms. They have an intramural arm, which is the research that's being done in-house. Um, at some level, a lot of that is focused on the main NIH campus in Bethesda. Um, however, that intramural arm, there are, um, depending on what you're working on, there are also intramural research centers throughout other parts of the United States. Um, for instance, people who are working on like really nasty um, microbial pathogens, there's sites out in the West. If you're interested in environmental health, um, the intramural site is in the um, University Park area, North Carolina. But fundamentally, this is the research that is done in-house by the NIH, and these are people who work directly for the NIH. Um, one thing to really think about as you, um, as when you talk to intramural investigators, their funding model is extraordinarily different than those than that experienced by those of us in the extramural community, in that intramural funding is usually based on retrospective analyses. So the intramural folks, whether they get resources or not, is based on what is the um, accomplishments from the prior five years of funding and that and the recommendations of an external advisory committee. So it's essentially the equivalent of a site visit is, is that they write up in detail what they did with the last five years of funding. They put very, very sketchy, um, explanation of what they're intending to do with the next five years of funding um, and that the external advisory committee is basically saying did you do did they do good stuff with their last increment of funding or not and should they get more should they get less or should it stay the same uh, so it's a very very different model um, that they don't typically write grants that have specific aims or anything like that now as i'm sure everybody listening is aware the extramural um, Grants making is very, very different. Um, the mission of the extramural program is different. And there are many institutes where research that is funded in the extramural program is distinctly different than the balance of research funded by the intramural program. Um, this is absolutely true in my field, the National Eye Institute. There is um, some strong research programs at the National Eye Institute, but they're very, very focused and they're a very small percentage of the breadth of the field of ophthalmology, while the extramural mission is has a huge amount of um, breadth to it. And the funding priorities in the extramural mission and the intramural mission can be extraordinarily different depending on how that institute is being run. Um, so I'm um, enough about the intramural program because unless you get a job offer there, it's probably not going to affect you. Um, so I'm going to really focus on this extramural mission. Now, um, the thing that a lot of early career scientists don't understand is, is that you think about applying for a grant to the National Cancer Institute, the National Eye Institute, um, heart, lung, and blood, child health, or whatever. 
but that's not the group you're going to be dealing with in the early stages of the grants process. And that is because most institutes do not handle their own grant review. The grant review is instead hired, um, handled by a NIH office that is separate from the institute system called the Center for Scientific Review. Um, the thing I want to emphasize is the Center for Scientific Review does no direct grant making in general. Um, however, it is the point that almost all NIH grant applications enter the NIH system. So when you go onto um, grants.gov, when you go and upload your grant, it's not in most cases going directly to an institute that has any money. It's instead going through an office of review. When your grant first hits, um, there's a set of decision trees that are being made. One is, is that they look to see which institute um, is most likely to have be interested in the focus of the grant. Uh, sometimes that grants can be assigned for consideration with multiple institutes, especially if the grant overlaps the mission of more than one institute. And that is something that if for many of us, it's really dead obvious what institute our funding will come from. For instance, I work in the field of ophthalmology. All of my grants are always assigned to the National Eye Institute, um, and there's really no question about that. However, um, there are people in my field who study the role of diabetes and eye disease. And in those cases, their grants could be considered by um, the institute that handles diabetes and diabetic complications, or they can be handled by the National Eye Institute. This is also similar for people who study op um, op ophthalmic cancers. So um, if you have a reason that you want your grant to really be considered by for funding by one institute versus another, um, it's always a good idea to specify what institute would be most appropriate for your grant in your cover letter. Um, this can be really important because um, different institutes can have widely disparate funding levels. Um, for instance, I'll use my example of people who study diabetes in the eye and diabetic complications. The funding rates for ophthalmology research as a percentage of funded of um, as a percentage of submitted grants in the area is way higher in ophthalmology than it is in, um, I think it's the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive Diseases or something like that. So it can be very advantageous for a grant to be considered for funding at the National Eye Institute because the same percentile through a study section is going to might be well within the funding line for one for the National Eye Institute and outside of the funding line for um, the institute that deals with diabetes complications. So, um, so it's often can be advantageous to focus your grant and just say in your cover letter because if you give them some, they don't always agree, but if you give them some indication of where that should go, um, it's absolutely helpful. Now, the, but the first thing that happens when a grant comes in is, is that the decision is being made that is this going to review going to happen through the Center for Scientific Review? Um, that's true for about 70% of all peer-reviewed grant applications is that the CSR is who deals with the grant review side. Um, however, there are some exceptions and there is some direct grant review that is done by the institutes. Um, the um, one big exception is K awards. And I know a number of people who are on this call might be interested in K awards. Um, K awards are often reviewed um, at the level of the Institute, but not always. Um, I've been on two flavors of K award panels and I've been on K award, um, K99 ROO panels that were um, basically reviewed through the um, Center for the National Eye Institute. I've also been on panels that were um, where the grant was reviewed through the Center for Scientific Review because the subject was something like developmental biology, which would cross multiple institutes. 
The, um, another exception for this can be group project and U awards um, that only some fields have group project and U awards and the review process is usually very extensive, including site visits. And in those cases, it's again, the institutes that tend to handle that review. And then there are also some special types of requests for applications and contracts. So if you see an RFA announcement, um, it may or may not be reviewed through the Center for Scientific Review or not. Okay. So um, is everybody okay right now? I'll stop talking for a little bit just to see if there's anybody who wants to hop in for a question. Okay. All right, so the next, um, so assuming in most cases you're gonna be interacting with the Center for Scientific Review, that and when you get your, after you apply, um, they will send you a notice saying that, yes, we got your grant. They will say which institute they think it might be most appropriate for, for consideration for funding. The other thing that they're gonna tell you is the assignment to a study section. Now, the assignment to a study section can be very, very important for a grant. I will um, talk about the example that I um, just gave about the people who study diabetic complications of eye disease, that there are study sections that talk that directly are investigating diabetic complications, and they will see grants that are diabetic complications in the eye, in the kidney, in the circulatory system and all sorts of different parts of the body. And in that case, the, all of the diabetes mechanism grants will be clustered together. Now, it's also true that there is a, um, that there is a study section that focuses predominantly on funding research that is um, related to the eye. So this is a case where the same grant might be reviewed in a different study section. And that um, sometimes that decision is made very arbitrarily. Um, sometimes it's made um, because of some direct expertise that are on the different study sections. Now, from the standpoint of the um, study section is, is that there are two flavors. There are these things called chartered study section. These are basically review groups that have that the NIH has sliced and diced every single um, possible type of science you can imagine into clusters where there's a permanent panel of well-published, well-funded senior scientists that are there as permanent members. Um, they're, that depending on, um, there's different ways that how long they're permanent members, but the, a lot of people are choosing to be on for a five-year term where they serve on two of the three yearly panels. They can also um, sign up to serve on three panels a year for three years. And, um, they're, and one of the things that you want to be very, very um, aware of is what study section would your work be appealing to? That um, if you, you can go to, uh, hopefully this link works. Here. So if you go to, assuming that it works, because I didn't check it this morning, yeah, there we go. So here is the roster index for standing study sections that you can see there are all these codes. So if you, um, when your grant is assigned to a study section, they're just going to tell you what this code is. That, let's say you're um, assigned to behavioral genetics and epidemiology. The actual, um, um, this is the actual information about that study section. Um, that there is a place on here, and I'm not seeing it right now, where it talks about what the mission of the study section is. That, so you will be able to read that stated mission and see whether your grant actually fits. But even more importantly is the roster. And the roster is who is on the study section. So if I click on this, this is the roster for this behavioral genetic study section that met in February of this year. The, um, all of these members are scientists that are in this field that we have here 
the chair this is the person who runs the meeting who is a scientist and then we also have members and this group of members if you go and then there's the scientific review officer and this is basically the administrative support person so if you have a question about the study section, this is the person you would contact, is the scientific review officer. And when you are up here looking, and I'm trying to remember the key now, I believe the, um, the starred people are people who are just on for a single meeting because of their, um, um, of their expertise was needed for a grant. The other people are permanent study section members, and there should be, this is gonna let me go back, okay, here, that um, if I go to the membership roster link, there, there's usually a link on here that also says who's on the study section and what are their terms. So view membership roster, I think this is it. So if we view the membership roster, what we have here is, is that this number 17, this means that this person is a permanent member of the study section until June of 2017. And this person's going off this June will be their last meeting. Then we have people who are going to be on here for the next several years. This was she's going to be on here until 2021. So one thing that's if you think your work might fit into a particular study section, it's really important to research the backgrounds of the members of the study section. What that's going to tell you is, is that really what are the expertise? It's not just what's said in the description. It's also the expertise of the people who are going to be voting and reviewing your grant. And to have a general idea, there's going to be certain the, these grants are short. I mean, people think of the 12 to 13 page grant as long, but it's actually very, very short. Um, if you're trying to explain how you're going to do five years of science for a million plus dollars. So there's certain things that are going to be known by the reader and you don't have space to reiterate it. But then there's also going to be clearly ideas, concepts and information that these permanent members are not going to be aware of. These are things that you're going to need to make sure you highlight. If there's people on this chartered study section that are um, in your field that you have a reason to believe um, you have a conflict with, um, then you're going to want to say, I don't want that person to review my grant for this particular reason. Um, you also, when you're looking at this list, if there's somebody who is like directly in your area and they're doing work that's very, very relevant to what you're doing, it's pretty important to put your work into the correct context, make sure that you are appropriately um, citing the study section member and that you understand how their work applies to yours. It's just a human nature type of thing. Um, but one thing to really be careful about, don't just um, don't just cite a study section member because they're a study section member. And if you cite them, make sure you get their science right. Um, I have been a member of a charter study section. And sometimes you'll get somebody who's clearly pandering to your expertise when you're a permanent study section member. And it's really, really obvious they're citing you um, for science that is not relevant to the um, area of the grant. And sometimes they'll cite you and even get the name of the gene wrong. It just looks bad. Uh, so if you're going to be, if you feel the need to cite a study section member, don't do it gratuitously. It'll, people will see right through it. Um, so the thing here is, is that we have the roster. So you, you can figure out what study sections are out there. What are the rosters of those study sections? and really kind of take a look at um, trying to make a decision on what, from your knowledge, would make sense in relationship to what your, review, your grant is reviewed in. And if your application would fit into several study sections, that I would really encourage you to think and strategize this and to um, request assignment to one study section versus another that you know, don't just request an off-the-wall study section. If you pick a study section, 
you know, really justify why you think that your grant fits into that study section. Those assignment requests are often um, are often honored if you if they're well justified. Um, that and you can ask for that in your cover letter. And again, this is a case of usually the person doing the assignments is doing a path of least resistance and they will agree to your initial um, study section request, but that's not always true. Now, it's not all that unusual that when you submit your grant, you're going to see the initial study section assignment and that'll be sent to you. However, it is not at all unusual for between the time you submit your grant, you get your original study section assignment and the actual day of review, your grant can change study section assignments. And this is because the scientific review administrators, the people or the scientific review officers, who the people who really um, maintain the grants process, they get a pile of grants that are assigned to them through Central. They then actually read these grants. They look at them in detail and they have a good idea of the expertise of the members of their study section versus the expertise of the members of other study sections. And they will come to the conclusion that a grant is outside of the actual expertise of their study section um, and that they will reassign your grant. So, you know, you can't just ask for a study section that makes no sense because the scientific review officers will really see that they can't easily assign your grant to any of their members. Um, but just kind of overall, that to have a general idea of who and where your grant is being reviewed is, is really um, important because how you emphasize and market your science is often going to um, be important because not all people or not all study sections will look at the same science the same way. So you want to be able to find the hook that will interest the reviewers that your grant is likely to receive. Um, there are definitely cases where somebody's doing great science, but because it goes to a study section where the scientists on the study section can't appreciate their science, it isn't well received, but it goes to another place, it is highly received. Um, there's an investigator, I mean, and that can be not just within NIH study sections, of course, that could be the difference between your grant being funded by the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. And um, that a couple colleagues of mine whose research never really gained any traction at the NIH have won the highest awards for the National Science Foundation. While on the other side is that I've been very successful over the years getting money from the National Institutes of Health and I haven't been able to get any traction at all with the National Science Foundation. The similar thing can happen with study sections, that once one study section with one culture and one way of looking at a scientific problem can find a grant very, very exciting, while another can't. Um, this, was a, this was very, very obvious with a recent report that was done by the National Institutes of Health, that people are always worried that the quality, however that's measured, of science going to different study sections is um, very uneven. And um, for instance, in the study section that the community always says, oh, this is a really, really tough study section and it's DEV1, it's for basic developmental biology grants. And it's true that a very large number of National Academy members and very, very high ranking scientists send their grants to that study section. So, they, um, so the NIH did this study where they basically took grants that were funded um, with good percentile scores from a whole host of study sections. And then they were assigned to um, people who were longstanding ex study section members to see if they get the same scores and the same percentile rankings um, in a second round of review that didn't count towards the funding of the grant. And they found that the study failed. And the reason the study failed is, is that the biggest um, predictor of whether or not a grant got a good score was the familiar, was whether or not the reviewer was familiar with the research in the grant or not. That, and I know I was one of the reviewers in this, um, in this panel, and that there were grants that 
you could just tell looking at them probably got amazing scores in the original study section because they were like a National Academy member who was doing like this really detailed research. And in the end, it's like, I couldn't care less about the science. I mean, it just seemed like, well, this is really boring. I don't care if it's a well-designed study. I couldn't rank it highly while I looked at, um, there was a grant that was in a young investigator that was in my same pile that was something that was a science was science that I could appreciate being really important. And I ranked that higher than this other grant. And it was because I could appreciate that science and understand why I cared about it more than I could the other grant. So study section assignments are really, really important here. Um, okay. So um, that, so any questions about, you know, trying to look at study sections and to prioritize where, or trying to influence, I should say, which study section your grant is reviewed from? Okay. Um, so the next thing that, um, that you do need to keep in mind is that in, for most of you who are listening, the study sections will be completely different from institutes because the, the study sections are combining grants based on the underlying scientific principles and interest. They are not, while institutes tend to be extraordinarily tissue specific or um, body organ system specific. So um, someplace like the National Eye Institute, for instance, can be funding research going everything from hardcore epidemiology to hardcore genetics to um, diabetes to cancer. They're interested in funding all of that if it's related to the eye. But, you, but a hardcore epidemiologist is not the person who should be reviewing a grant on the cell biology of ocular wound healing. So for that reason, grants end up getting farmed out based on their science, and then they're broken back down to the institutes. Like, um, it's almost, net, but there are some exceptions. For instance, in the field of ocular biology, there's two study sections that pretty much only review grants focused on the eye, um, because there are certain scientific problems that might not be of interest to general science, but they're really, really clinically important to the eye. And those grants have been also um, parsed out. But the National Eye Institute funds grants that are seen by hardcore epidemiology study sections, hardcore um, social science study sections, hardcore um, diabetes study sections, but then they also fund grants that are going to the more eye preferred study sections. Okay, so that's what's going on with chartered study sections. However, there are cases where grants can't be reviewed by a chartered study section. There's a whole host of reasons for this. Um, a really big one is, is that if there's a special solicitation, and that's usually a situation where it's appreciated that there's this cutting edge idea or this cutting edge methodology that is in use in a very small subset of biomedical research. And the goal is to broaden the approach um, that a one more recent one like this has to do with doing, using bioinformatic tools to model diseases or to predict whether or not a particular MAP gene could be responsible for a particular disease. Um, there's an investigator in my department who, um, basically um, put a grant into this where the focus of the grant was actually on eye research, but the RFA was looking for new approaches to study biomedical problems that use computational biology, bioinformatic systems biology approaches. So he responded to that RFA. The most of the reviewers on the study section were not experts on the basic scientific problem. They're experts on computational approaches to study biomedical things. So um, that, that went to what was called a special emphasis panel, which is a one-time study section that's put together 
with a combination of expertise needed to review the set of special grants that have been um, solicited. The other reason that special emphasis panels are convened is that there's conflicts of interest within an existing panel. So under those circumstances, um, imagine if one of your major collaborators is the chair of the chartered study section that the grant would go to, or even if you are a member of a chartered study section, your grant cannot be reviewed by that study section because of conflicts of interest. If you are a mentee or a collaborator of one of these study section members, or even in some cases, if you publish within three years with a study section member, your grant is prohibited, is certainly prohibited for, by being reviewed by these people, but in some cases, they don't even want the grant reviewed by the panel that that person is on. So when there are these conflicts of interest, the two possibilities are your grant is reviewed by that panel, but the person with the conflict of interest is sent out of the room and the door is closed behind them and then they're asked back in once your grant has been reviewed. That would be a what would be considered a minor conflict of interest, such as you've published with somebody in the past three years or something like that. Um, however, if there's a major conflict of interest, either because you are a member of the panel and your colleagues on the panel are reviewing your grant, or you are a major collaborator or a member of the panels at co-PI, then it's assigned to these special emphasis panels, which are again, one-time panels. They're, they can be quite small. Um, I serve on a lot of these. They can be, you know, only have three or four grants that are being looked at. And the goal and what they, how they assign the reviewers is usually people who have been on permanent members of study section. They tend to be people who are very, very senior in the field who do not need to be calibrated with these uh, main study section. And there's a short meeting that might review three or four grants. You give people get their final priority scores. And then the percentiles are put together by um, all of the scores from these special emphasis panels being aggregated into one large special emphasis panel percentile ranking. Sometimes that can be helpful, sometimes that can be a problem because you might end up with a lower percentile or I mean a worse percentile going to a special emphasis panel because a lot of the grants that go to these are very, very well established investigators. Um, so your actual percentile may be worse than it would be if you got the same score under the regular study section. So, is um, so are there any other are there any questions about study sections or st strategizing study section assignments or anything like that at this point? Okay. So then I want to go to your grant has now been assigned to a study section and um, it is being um, and it is assigned to study section. It is reviewed by, it is assigned to three members of that study section. They read the grant, they score the grant, and the grants that are in the top 50 percentile or so of the preliminary scores are then discussed within the study section. And based on the discussion, the rest of the panel will vote on the grant. Um, keep in mind that a large proportion of those who are voting on your grant have never read your grant. They're going to base their score completely on the description and the opinions of those who are permanently assigned to it. Um, a lot of this is done to sort of diffuse the responsibility so that you know no one person is um, in charge of a particular score, but it also is a case where definitely your score is going to be largely driven by the opinions of those who read the grant and wrote your written critiques. So at this point, you now have, there is now, your grant has been scored. At that point, it leaves the um, um, purview of the Center for Scientific Review, and it goes to the institute or institutes where it's been assigned to um, possible funding. 
there are situations where one grant might be within the domain of two different institutes. This could um, involve things such as sometimes institutes will share the funding of a single grant. Sometimes one institute has a much higher funding rate than another so that the um, institute with the better funding rate will take on the grant. Um, but it's a negotiation that they do. This is also a situation where your grant might get, um, there are certain situations where there are funds for idea states such as Delaware and um, South Carolina, where um, money from the idea um, grant pool can go in and will co-fund a grant with an institute. Okay, so just, so you have some idea of who, what's going to happen to your grant then. I've already mentioned the scientific review administrator or scientific review official. It looks like they might have changed the acronym. They work for the Center for Scientific Review. And the thing about these people that you have to understand is that they have no role in making funding decisions. Scientific review administrator's job and responsibility is completely done once there's a score and a summary statement of your reviews generated for your grant. Once that process is done, that information, your grant and your reviews are then sent to the program officer. The program officer is a person who actually works to the Institute. They have a lot of responsibility for making funding decisions that these folks um, often will sit in at the study section meetings and listen, or they will dial in and listen via video conference on the study section meetings. So they're listening to what people are saying about your grant. Um, this is again a place where, you know, one of the things I think why people feel that the NIH grants process is a little bit arbitrary is, is that it's not only did the reviewer like your grant, it's sometimes that if your grant is on the funding line, it can be how articulate the people who reviewed your grant are in emphasizing the grant's importance. So whether the program officer, if the program officers are also scientists, so they have their own opinions, but if somebody's very, very eloquent about your grant being incredibly important and that grant's on the funding line, you have a better chance of getting the grant than somebody whose um, reviewers aren't as eloquent talking about it. Now, the program officer, their job is to build grants that they recommend for funding. Um, the selection is, um, and they select for potential funding. They don't make the final decision. Now, they base this on two things. They base it on grant score and fit with institutional priorities. And I can't emphasize enough that institutional priorities are important here. Um, this is why grant funding is not just about the score or the pay line. Sometimes you'll hear um, grants that are scored worse getting funded while those who are scored better not getting funded. This is because that there can be situations where there's too many grants in a certain area that went in on a single um, cycle. Um, this happened in my field a couple years ago that there were a whole bunch of, like everybody in the field of um, viral um, corneal keratopathy submitted their grants at the same time, it seems. And a lot of these grants received very, very good scores that the Institute is not going to spend its entire budget on grants in just one small area, even though they all received excellent scores. They have to be funding a breadth of research in a particular, in, under their aegis. So you can get grants that are scored that are maybe the best grant in a particular important scientific area get funded, even if their relative score is quite a bit worse than um, another area. It's how the institutes basically re-jigger um, the balance of who's doing what scientifically. Um, and the thing to keep in mind is that this depends on the institute, but it's not unusual for some grants to be very close or even hit what's considered a pay line not to receive funding. Now, the program officer's job is to make recommendations. Now, their recommendations carry an enormous amount of weight. Um, the person that if your grant is scored near a pay line, 
it is um, their opinion is going to depend, is going to focus a lot on whether that grant is paid. Um, however, sorry. Uh, this is one reason that it can be extraordinarily helpful to try to make personal connections with your program officers. The NIH sends the program officers out on a regular basis to the community. Uh, what I mean by that is that they often are sent to major scientific conferences in the field. <coughs> um, for instance, the program officer that takes care of my grant, he is unfailingly at the major eye research meetings and he goes to the poster sessions and he sits at the major platform presentations in the field. He listens to the presentations knowing what <coughs> um, grants he's funded or not. He's exceptionally aware of what grants are close to the pay line that science is being presented. And he really looks to see also how that science is being um, um, proposed or being um, received by the community that, you know, if you can, you know, seek these people out, you know, don't act too, too needy or too, um, but take that as an opportunity to really talk to the program officer about your science, but also talk to your program officer about your um, personal situation. Um, there was a faculty member in my department that was very close to the pay line for their NIH grant um, that, and it, and they were up for tenure. So it was a situation that if they hadn't gotten that grant, their chances of tenure would plummet. And she was able to talk to the program officer and say, look, you know, I am up for tenure. Um, the only thing I've published a lot, but the only thing missing is having a major grant award. And her grant was pretty much right at the pay line. And not only did this pro because of her situation, not only did her program officer pay the grant, he expedited its actual start date. It was supposed to start um, December 1st based on the um, what she had applied for. He arranged for that to start September 30th because September 30th is when the um, tenure decision from the department had to be in to the college. So um, it's is again a case where the program officer he was looking at this as the potential to really lose a very, very good young scientist from the field. And by funding the grant three months earlier, he ensured that, that she would remain in the field for the long term. I know that I've also, um, you know, I, I can't necessarily say that this was for sure, but I had a grant on a pay line a few years ago and the basically the paper that all the preliminary data was in from the time that the reviews came out and the time that funding decisions were being made, all the preliminary data had been published in a very prestigious journal. And I saw the program officer at the, and I, my grant was on the pay line. And I said to the program officer at the conference that, you know, after the review, the, all the preliminary data is in this prestigious journal and, um, you know, and I actually then sent him a copy of the of the acceptance letter for the paper. And I'm sure that was a huge influence on whether or not that grant was funded or not, just based on a lot of things that had been said at the time. So, you know, the program officer is somebody you do want to be communicating with. It really can help and matter. Um, now, but I do want to emphasize the program officer is only making recommendations that once the program officer comes up with a list of grants that they'll come up with a list of grants of definitely fund and then not fund and then fund if resources are available. This set of recommendations then goes to the council. Now, what the scientific council is, is a group of experienced senior scientists and they're there to provide a second round of peer review after the initial scores. Um, that these are the people that if you feel that your primary peer review was not um, fair or that it was highly biased, they're the people who basically make decisions about those protests about inappropriate reviews. 
um, that you have to, if one thing just to, as a side note, be really, really sure before you protest because um, there are people who want to protest that really have no leg to stand on. All this does is make people have a bad opinion of you. So if you're going to protest an inappropriate review, you better have a really good case for that. Um, but to go back to what most of the scientific council does is, is that they take a second look at the recommendations for funding from the program officer. Um, most cases, this is a rubber stamp um, situation where, yeah, you got a three third percentile and everybody loved all the um, people in the original grant really loved it. Yeah, of course, you're going to fund that. Um, but the uh, what they spend all their time on is sometimes there are grants that are below the standard pay dying that the program officer decides not to recommend for funding. These are discussed and that recommendation is either validated or overturned. And then there are also the program officer can recommend grants for funding that are worse than the pay line. These are situations where the program officer really wants to have a certain kind of science funded because it's an area that is underserved in the um, field. And the scientific council or the people who either confirm that decision or they'll say, no, this sucks and you shouldn't be funding it. I don't care if it's in an underserved area. Um, and these are also, so the scientific counselor will say, well, council will say, yes, these, uh, we agree with you. These are grants that certainly should be funded. Um, that, yeah, we understand that these are great grants that you don't have money for. You know, these are kind of the order of, um, of operations and how to consider that. But the scientific council basically um, is, this, is supposed to be a second round of peer review to ensure that the very best science is being funded. Um, so, and then after council um, does their recommendations, then, they're, then that's given back to the program officer who basically starts sending out um, awards or starts um, putting together award letters, which then have to be signed off on for the director of extramural research. And once that's done, then you have your money. So um, is there any questions about sort of the process that a grant goes through in the sense of a funding decision at this point? Okay. So, um, that I just want to briefly um, just say that, um, and I think a lot of people here know this, but um, to just keep in mind that there are a lot of award types. Um, basically, the community usually thinks of our grants, but there are also, of course, the pay grants, which can be useful for all sorts of different things. Um, and these are the training career development grants. Um, and that if you are in any of these categories, I would absolutely read the guidelines and try to find people who've gotten them because sometimes the directions aren't very um, informative in relationship to the best um, way to um, apply for K-type grants. And since I think I've spoken an hour, um, I will stop here and kind of open it up for questions at the end of things. And, um, you know, if you have any questions, you know, jump in. And if you don't, you know, I'm glad you could come. And um, I believe Aaron and I were trying to work out what are the next, we know that the next two um, um, awards or next two sessions, one's going to be on how to deal with grant critiques and what do they need. And the other one is going to be on um, non-NIH sources of funding. And um, that we'll be sending out um, confirmation about which one is which. One's in May and one's in June. And I'm not 100% sure which is which. So. So with that, I guess we will, since nobody's asking any questions, um, we can shut down for the day. And um, if there's anything that um, that you want to ask, you know, kind of offline in relationship to how to strategize study sections for the NIH, I'd be happy to talk to you offline about that. Okay. Thank you.